call to order the meeting of the Sunderland School Committee at 6 p.m. on February 7th, 2024. First, uh, first item on the agenda is approving the minutes from our January meeting. Motion from Amanda. Second. Second from Megan. Uh, Peter is taking minutes remotely. Yeah, thank discussion? you for. No discussion. All in favor. Aye. Four in person in favor. And Peter is raising his hand online. Thank you. Uh, next financial statement. Okay. Uh, I emailed you out the expense reports. Not a whole lot has changed since the last meeting. If you were to look at like the bottom line, it was very minimal changes, which is primarily due to warrant payments that we made. That's really where the difference came in. There's no new concerns. Um, we did sign, or you did sign, 16 warrants electronically since the last meeting, totaling $38,384.90. Um, and then I have one other item to touch on, but if anyone has questions about the financial reports, I'll answer those first. Okay. Um, so we wanted to bring up here because capital is not on the agenda as an item, but this is financial related. So we wanted to give you an update on the oil tank project and some change orders that have come in um, that Darius has been in conversation with the town about covering. So I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about all right. Um, so the tank, good news, tanks and grounds, and we're running off of it at this point. Um, the bad news is during the, we believe during the excavation process, the conduit to the lights in the parking lot was hit. Um, and we're now kind of in the discovery to find out where, because the, the guys digging claim they didn't see it and but it happened at the same time so um today after school today they were going to take down the pole and try to trace the lines for the conduit and so on and so forth um general the town that? is helping us out yeah, didn't get that. yeah. Okay. so yeah so um and so george is over in dpw george being, george is great for those of you who don't know him. um he you know is going to you know he brought the excavator over to, to do that Looking at costs of this, it's probably about $5,000 worth of electrical and would be probably another $5,000 worth of excavating, but um, the town's going to help us out, George. will help us out with that. Um, whether or not we can get money back from the crew, I had a conversation with the foreman on site today. Um, you know, didn't budge much on that, so it's going to be more of a process of with we'll do more investigating of where it was cut and that kind of stuff, and then to be able to react to that, because it could be coincidences, but the way the inside of the panel of the building was ripped out, something very strong pulled on. So it's very clear that it's, it wasn't severed, it was torn um, right out. So, um, and also for disclosure, we, our prints did not show a conduit going through there. So we don't know. And so going back to other people, there's uh, the towns who were working with people who were part of the original project who will be available on Friday to come in and look at. Um, to tell us where they believe the conduit's running because they could have gone around the whole field and it got hit somewhere else and i don't know so we're kind of in a um figuring it out phase i did let jeff know kevin snow town hall that we don't have five thousand dollars in our budget to cover it and if they would be if we are to cover it out of our budget it would be directly didn't want to be blackmailing but i, I said right now we're using reserve funds to offset the next year's budget so if you want us to cover it, we'll just take five thousand off of off of next year's budget. But I imagine they would rather use their free cash instead of inflating a budget they don't have to. So, um, so I kind of let them know that, and he's going to put on their next um, select board agenda um, that as well. There's a second change order to dispose of the oil that was remaining in the original tank. The contract had six hundred gallons built into it as part of the base bid price there was um, 1,500 gallons in the tank. And so they have to dispose of that um, properly through EPA and we're being charged for the 900 gallon overage, an additional $1,800. So. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It, just gets, it just gets to me. So it's one of those where 
be frank, if we were more on top of how it exactly worked, when they were exactly going to start and when they were going to actually disconnect, we probably could have saved some money. Um, there is sludge level within the bottom, so you're going to lose a certain a third, a quarter, something like that of the tank, no matter what, anyways. Um, you know, they're only going to siphon off so much. We chose not to do a, a larger temporary tank, and that was to save money in the long run. We probably could have saved more money by getting a larger tank because we could have pulled more fuel had we known we were going to have more fuel when they started. You know, it's a finger pointing thing. You know, I'm going to point somewhere else. We could have figured out we could have been more on top of it. Someone who's done this before could have explained to us, like, you really want to be on top of this and the starting date and that kind of thing. The, currently, the temporary tanks got fuel in it, but um, they don't care how it gets emptied. And this is not, of course, has to be legally. But um, George is coming over and has the pump system, DPWS pump system, to get that, all that diesel out. So at least, at least somebody will get that diesel. We'll still be, they're not going to raise it. The DPW is not going to raise a check, but <laughs> we're not going to raise a check um, to them to cut, you know, dig the hole in a few weeks. So kind of we're trying to save money wherever we can there um, to make up for it. But, you know, could we have saved 500 bucks? You know, I mean, you're going to lose some fuel within that exchange because they don't want, they don't want to be sucking down too close to the sludge and then try to use that off. I don't know exactly how they use that off, but so yeah, I call it the cost of doing business. That probably could have been done better. If we did it again, we do it very differently. Let's just put it that way. So there was also a concern about not having enough oil to keep the building heated right. while we were like in transition. So right. we could have probably ordered a little bit less on our last delivery and saved some money there. But, you know, at this point, it is what it is. And right. the price didn't freeze. <laughs> yes. That would, would have added to the cost. Yes. Right, yes. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, if in the can I ask, yes, please. if in the exploration of uh, the electrical line, is there something in the contract that spells out who's responsible for that cost? Um, they have some protections that they only know what's in the prints that they're going into. There's debate there whether or not, depending on who you talk to, about what level of responsibility they have within the hole that they're digging that isn't on the what they're exposed to find expected to find. In it, where they expect to do if they hit it or repair it. So, you know, um, there was another line that was uh, nicked, so to speak, and they repaired it. Another condo had been on the ball field that took a meter right out. It's not the same line coming out. Um, it's not the same route as this other line because we, we can't find where the other route's coming out of the building right now. Um, so there's a little bit on us in the sense that it's not on any plan. So whoever did the laying of that conduit wherever they submitted those plans, the school district's not in possession of them. So was it not done? Did they not submit the plans? Did they have plans and then nobody kept them? It's a little, it's a little odd if we were going back 30 years, mm. you know, so something like that could have happened, but. Um, yeah, know. and the wiring goes under the blacktop and under part of the building, right? Correct. And so, mm. yeah, it's not a, Main line that DigSafe is going to pick up when it comes through. It's yeah. not a high voltage and that kind of stuff. Or if it wasn't on, I don't know exactly how that works, but it didn't get picked up when they did that. I mean, there's already other power lines going out to the tank. So they're not going to be picking up that. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm talking just in the, the full length of my knowledge of it, even though I was on site pointing at different things. But it's kind of like when you forget your engine and you're like, yeah, that's not working in your car. And, it's also one of those things where it will cost us more to litigate if we wanted to go after them than the five thousand dollars that we're gonna pay. So but we'll see. We'll still we'll see where the you know if they're at fault, and then we'll have a conversation with the higher ups and see if we can get some help there. Thank you. So that's the update there. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Principal's report? Great. Um, one of our goals on the school improvement plan uh, through the school council is community outreach. And um, one initiative we have undertaken on a smaller scale last year and a much bigger scale this year is Math Club, which started early fall 
Um, we have host teachers, grade one, Barb Fukushima, grade two, Jack Petrino, and grade three, Lisa Zadwarning. And although those are the three faculty members that are hosting the math clubs in the rooms, many other faculty members are helping out and volunteering their time. Um, this is a low stakes, um, high reward atmosphere where caregivers come in, play games with teachers, play games with fellow classmates, play games with older students as well. And it's all around math. Um, there's uh, just a beautiful joy in the air every Thursday morning here. So a special thank you to all of our um, faculty and staff for supporting this. And we've, um, the every Thursday it's ranged from 25 to 70 participants. And so it's really been a huge success. And then at the end of January, can I make a comment on that? Sure. Or, yeah. So I, I, we're a frequent participant last year and this year. And I, it, there's another piece of it too is the interaction between other parent, other caregivers, as you check in and, and get to talk and communicate. And um, and it's diverse. It's super diverse, which is Central Elementary School. We have all range of kids and families there. Uh, the other thing we talk about it just creates an energy for the day, especially mm -hmm. when you have. 70 to so exactly like <laughs> almost half well so that's adults too but say a third a quarter of the kids are all excited just to come to school early which is great yeah. like they just go in and yeah it's math but it's games it's fun it's festive and so there's so many layers there it's so exciting to do you know as a parent or caregiver to come in and be part of it and and the teachers run in are fantastic <laughs> sure and, and and on top of that our, our pto has supported the this initiative with um, providing money for snacks. Our uh, kitchen kitchen staff uh, brews a fresh pot of coffee and has fresh food set out. And the classroom teachers also bring some other nice snacks each day. So it's a really positive experience. Now, on the financial side, not to make it, I mean, just do good whatever we do. There. There's a stipend for the lead teachers. It's stipend for all three of them, or how there is, is yeah. Okay. So one of um the line items in our brief grant is community engagement okay. and so the lead teachers do get a stipend um for planning time um and uh part of the math club which is outside of the contractual hours and vicky wrote that miss paul was the writer that grant because i know she's taking numbers every time and she said this is for the grant no that's a different thing. no that's a that would i'm not sure what grant yeah. you're referring to yeah. Um, this reparent we get each year, uh, our directors of curriculum instruction. Oh, that's good. Okay. okay. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, it's a non, it's not, it's a non competitive entitlement grant based on your, based on our rural and populations that have it. So <clears throat> you have to submit paperwork. Yeah, submit paperwork, but it's not getting, yeah, you're not right. getting, right. you're not getting it based on what everybody else is getting. You're getting it based on your need. Right. <clears throat> And then um, once again, we welcomed our school community for International Night. This year it was held on Thursday, January 25th. Um, we had to make a uh, last uh, minute change um, with the uh, musician. So um, actually, and, uh, Jessica helped line someone up. And so talented musician Jennifer Cass played for students, caregivers, and staff. Um, the International Night always features a potluck dinner, um, so the families bring um, in their own dish uh, that is celebrated in their family. Uh, this event is supported by countless staff members, and they really make it a, um, a huge success. This year, we changed it up uh, a portion of it, and our general music teacher, Susan Matsui, supported by our one of our special education teachers, Mr. Joshua Santiago Aran, um, led and, and with the help of some sixth grade student ambassadors, um, did a Japanese puppet theater performance, um, which is really wonderful. Um, Sue Matsui lived in Japan for a number of years and has authored um, around 35 books in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, this was, we used this night to present our mosaic, the mural, which is right outside the library. And we obtained funding through our, um, through the STARS 
STARS grant, the residency grant through the Mass Cultural Council, and that uh, project was facilitated by Cynthia Fisher of Big Bang Mosaics. And all in all, we had around 250 members attend this event. Um, Vicki Palmer is the leading catalyst behind it, but again, it was supported by many different uh, staff. So overall, it was a huge success. Any questions? One more thing that I'm aware of, again, from a part of it, but Matt Howe is starting up the um, conversations with the LPAC families um, to talk about supporting uh, second language, English as a language, English learners, parents, parents yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's picking up again, so I didn't actually throw that in, that's a great thing, and I was on it last year, I'm back on it this year, so it's, um, it's another great time to meet other caregivers from a diverse community. Yeah, the first meeting for the steering community uh, committee is this coming Monday right. after school, and then there will be another meeting on Wednesday morning, yeah. so the school can make that. Thank you for the update and thank you to all of the staff making those special things happen. That's really exciting. Uh, any public comments tonight? We have nobody in person. Would anybody online like to make a comment? Well, thank you for attending. I'm seeing no public comments online. Let's move on to unfinished business. We have a slate of policies for the second reading to vote in the changes. We have a motion. I'll move, Shane. The motion from Amanda. I second the motion. Second from Joe. Uh, we went over these briefly last time. We've gotten a new copy that showed clearly the changes. Is there any discussion on these? No discussion here. No discussion from Peter. Uh, all in favor? Oh, should, should I read off these policies? Policies AA, AA-1, ACA, BGF, CHCA, EEA, EC, EEAG, GBI, GCA, GCK, GDB, HB, JF, JFBD, and JFBD1. All in favor? Aye. Four in person and Peter online. <laughs> and similarly, voting to remove policies CL, FBD, GA, GCCD, GDQD, GCQE, GDQC, policy H, JBA, JHBBA, JHC, and JKA. We have a motion to remove these policies. Okay. Megan is making a motion. Also, yeah. Amanda's making a second. <laughs> Any discussion? I just want to make a comment for someone who's been cleaning out his basement for a month. I'm glad we're doing that. I know the policy <laughs> needs to be cleaned up. I mean, it's, it's, thank you, Darius, for pushing us down. I mean, <laughs> if you think that just those initial are tough, you should see us in the meeting. We are we hysterically laugh about half the time trying to figure out what one we're on. Especially with mild dyslexia, I can screw up all the letters at any time. Right. All right. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of removing said policies. Four yeses in person plus Peter online. Thank you. And we are on to the FY25 budget. Okay. I have paper copies for you of the presentation, but I am going to share my screen. I printed the line by line and the full slide presentation for you. If you don't want them at the end, I can take them back and try them. So I'm going to move pretty quickly because I don't want to repeat um, some of the historical info or the background on the budget process in this because we did go over it already this uh, past month. So I'm going to jump right into the numbers. Of course, stop me if you have questions and we'll have plenty of opportunity for discussion as we go. So last month, uh, we talked about starting with the level service budget and what that would look like for Sunderland Elementary School, which comes in at 6.34%. Uh, there are several factors contributing to that increase, uh, wages, other expenditures, and then adjustments for grant and revolving funds. Uh, you can see here each of the different um, categories. The unit A is anyone who's on the teacher contract. Unit C is anyone who's on the IA contract. School-based staff is pretty self-explanatory, central office. And then I did make a note here that we have uh, we talked a lot about this last time that this year there is a 
extra teacher because we have somebody on maternity leave that that teacher is covering for. That teacher is retiring, so we've captured that savings in the budget because that position won't be. Um, so that's accounted for here. Uh, non wage increase included employee separation costs that we are required to pay out for the contract for retirements. And then other expenditures included some minor adjustments for things like trash removal, um, some of our utilities that have been under budget for a few years now, but it's time to right side those accounts and make sure that we have proper funds. And then in level service budget, I always start with looking at what grants are short term and we may not have in the future. In Sunderland's case, that does refer to ESSER. There will not be ESSER funding available next year, so we've made an adjustment for that here. And then I look at revolving funds as well to make sure that revolving funds that have been paying expenses in the prior year can continue to carry those expenses moving forward. Uh, our school choice fund we've talked about repeatedly now is seeing decline in revenue. Expenses need to start to come down off of that. So there is an adjustment in the budget of $50,000 to account for that revolving fund adjustment. Once we've gone through level services, we look at new requests and initiatives, uh, which from an administrative perspective, while we're listing them as new requests because we haven't necessarily funded them in this capacity before, they're really a continuation of needs to, in order for the school to fully operate. So field trips, equity and access is allowing more families uh, if they need assistance for their student to go on trips, as well as providing support for proper busing because transportation costs are through the roof across the board. Uh, curriculum consumable increase there is due to some of our new curriculum that we're putting out for math and ELA. General supplies, building repairs, and then the medical supplies and materials, those are all primarily increased due to inflation cost of supplies and services from vendors. So this is a minimal uh, increase here, but we did want to include it. So we're at 6.83% when we're looking at new requests and initiatives. Uh, we also talked about options to bring that number down uh, next year. And uh, Darius and I presented a few different things for you all to consider. Uh, the items on the left side of the page where we were sort of given that straw vote green light. Let's use the rural aid. We have it available. Uh, and then there was a consensus to ask the town to fund employee separation costs again, as they have in the past. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about what the budget looks like making those two changes. The third uh, recommendation or option that we presented to you was to reduce the budget by $60,000, which would have to be done through a staffing reduction. Um, there wasn't a lot of positive feedback on this in the first round because it would directly impact someone's job. We don't have any other attrition that we're aware of. There's no additional retirements to capture. Um, so we would be talking about letting an existing staff member or multiple staff members if the administration chose to go the route of um, reducing IAs instead of reverse reducing a teaching position. So we held off on that part. We didn't pull any funds out for that, but you are going to see that come up as part of our discussion as we go through this process here. Sherry, yeah. it's 60000 I know we're not, we're not using it. Is that just an average? How do you come up with 60? Um, so it's basically a mid-level mid -level, okay. teacher position okay. on the contract. And then the one page before, I just questioned, yeah. the 55000 for separation, yes. is that typical or is that just something this year? Uh, we tend to have had them year after year, year after year. year in Sunderland, and it does fluctuate depending on how many teachers retire okay. and when they put in for their retirement determines what fiscal year they put on. Um, 55 has probably been about the norm, I think, for Sunderland for multiple years, um, which is two-ish teachers for a while now, yeah. at least since COVID. Between 40 and 60 years yeah. would be the range. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. You're I, I did go to a select board meeting and give them a heads up about that item, and they seemed like they were inclined to support that as its own item on the town meeting board. It's one of those things where you don't necessarily want to increase your budget for a one-time expense, but if it is happening every single year, it might be something to consider. Like. Deerfield has that in their budget because 
they're the largest of the elementary schools and they're almost always going to see at least one retirement at least they have for a long at least the last five years so um, they have a placeholder the other small schools do not we typically try to find other funding sources and other towns have helped that as well so if Sunderland's not alone on doing that we, we did it last year and I think Conway did it two years ago so all right so uh, let's talk about what the draft currently looks like being presented today with those changes um, which is not a reduction actually in the budget we're maintaining level services we're just supplementing with other funding sources so our level services was about 3.5 million we reduced that by almost 89,000 and we're currently at um, 3494603 which is 4.19 percent um, sounds much better than the 6.83 you know it feels good it, it still feels high i think considering where our numbers have been in the past um which i couldn't get it, yes. it makes sense for where inflation was last year to come in this year i mean it's not typically that high right 6.8 um well if you look back oh you have the, the paper I, there yeah. scroll to the last page of that um slide presentation yeah. joe i think is the historical data, okay. which is what I have on the screen um, here. Sunderland has had some higher yeah. years. Oh. Typically, it <clears throat> correlates with staffing changes. Like last year, we added in a position. We partial funded that with ESSER, but then there was also some um, impact on the general fund. Uh, 23, I think we also added a position, right? We added your um, team lead that year. So those higher numbers have correlated with adding staffing. Going back to 2020, yeah. that was a big adjustment that was made because of a revolving fund, uh, particularly school choice loss. So the town helped us out. It was an override. There was a lot of work done by the school committee to make sure that the budget passed. So um, I think you know, looking at those numbers, four feels like it's in the middle. I, most of our towns would think it's still a little bit high, but I don't necessarily know what the state of Sutherland's finances are right now to speak to that. All right, let's go back up here. Um, so we are at 4.19% for the draft budget that we're presenting this evening. And I wanna talk a little bit about budget composition. So we looked at this in a general sense last time because uh, we didn't have a budget honed in on now that we're at the 4.19%. We've actually populated those figures into the charts on the next few pages. Um, the theme remains the same where the majority of our expenses are going to instruction. So uh, staffing and expenditures related to teaching and learning, um, which is where they should be. And then you can see the different pieces of the pie there, operations and maintenance is the next highest in single one. I did look up nationally, 80%, three, three state or 81 percent across every state, so we're right there. Yeah. Uh, going along with that theme a little bit further, 82% of that is uh, directly related to uh, salaries and wages, and you can see it's primarily for, again, those related to teaching and And other expenses, it sort of spreads out a little bit further. Um, maintenance and building operations is a big chunk of our other expenditures. And then also pupil services, which covers transportation, regular transportation and special education transportation. So that's why that piece of that pie is a little bit larger than the other sections. All right, revolving funds and grants. So you can see here from this chart that Sunderland Elementary uses just over $600,000 in additional funding to supplement the budget. So that is a direct offset to the general fund. If we did not have these other funding sources, uh, the budget would be that much higher because everything that is paid from these grants, uh, it's primarily staffing that is paid from these grants. Those are all needed to continue to run a school. And how are those numbers compared to other years? I mean, school choice is about the same, or is that? Um, these numbers are very close to what they are in prior years because the 
primary change is only related to bola increases or step increases for salaries and wages. So you're going to see them go up slightly uh, because of the staff that we're paying from these <laughs> funds. Title one is always 18,000. That's Sunderland's allocation. IDEA doesn't change a whole lot because that's based on a, a calculation. That's a special education grant. Um, but school choice and early childhood, you'll see Ooh, those yes. rural aid is uh, we haven't used yeah. rural aid to offset the budget right. in the past. Is that because we don't know until it's too late? Can we get those numbers late in the summer? Is that why we put it in? Right. So, I mean, they really exactly that does have a hand in it. And so this is the first year where we did, we decided, hey, we can, we're going to guess that they're going to um, work, work with at least level funding. We're hoping for at least level funding. Um, and so we're not using all of it. We're still leaving a buffer. So do, you said, hey, let's look at one basically around 1% um, of our budget to, you know, off of the growth off the aid. That was kind of our, our measuring stick that we decided to use, but still leave some in case that gets reduced. Because it does get reduced, then that means automatically got to pull them somewhere else or cut somewhere. So. And rural aid and prior to this year has not been at the level that Sunderland has received. We received, I want to say 53,000-ish. Is that number right? I think I'm remembering that right, because we paid for the transportation costs already for that um, student who is deemed homeless from another town. Um, prior years, it's fluctuated because it's been based on um, population and density. So we haven't received the tier. This is the first year I think we're in tier two. We've flipped back and forth. Yeah. We're, our student population from town is right on the cusp. Right. So sometimes we're in the, the bigger group and sometimes we're in the smaller group. Um, um, but our population isn't really growing, so we feel <laughs> confident unless they change something with this, uh, the language behind it, because the governor's budget did come out with um, this being more competitive and not based on that three-tiered system. Uh, rumor has it that the House and the Senate are going to stick with that tier funding and which should keep us eligible to stay in tier two and remain on track for the same funding. So the population we use is the student population or the yes. town population? Students yeah. within the town. Within yeah. the so it doesn't okay. count school choice okay. kids. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. So what does our budget look like uh, when we add in revolving funds and grants, just so you know what the total cost is? Because we talk so much about the general fund and we don't talk about all of it together very frequently. So. Uh, general fund number there for you, grants and revolvings. I broke those out just so you could see what the difference was. And then our total is just over four million. So that is the true cost to educate our students and operate the school. And that's the same question with grants. Is that usually what we have? Is that high and low? It's just kind of the usual. It's about the same. same yeah. A little bit higher because we are using the rural aid this year that we haven't used in the past. All right, so what's next? Uh, where do we go from here? Um, we wanted to open the conversation back up. Um, while we certainly heard the school committee say that there, there's a desire not to reduce staffing, uh, particularly because it will impact individuals' lives, uh, and we recognize that that's a really difficult decision to make. Um, but my job is to advise you in being fiscally responsible. So I want to make sure we're not losing sight of that as part of this conversation as we continue to go through the process. Um, so budget changes to date have been supplemental. We haven't actually reduced the budget yet. If we did want to have changes mm -hmm. from that 4.19%, uh, it would require a reduction in actual expenditure, such as staffing, like we already talked about. And while it is a difficult decision, um, it's setting us up for future success in budget years to come. You know, we're not just looking at what does it look like now. You know, we want to be prepared for the future so that it's not always, it doesn't always feel so challenging. You feel like we continue to have really challenging budget conversations and that's normal, but we also have an opportunity given our uh, class sizes to consider a staffing reduction. <clears throat> I think um, to add on to the, the concerns about future budgets. So uh, Shelly and I were at a, uh, went to a conference on last Friday from the uh, Taxpayers Foundation. 
Mass, Mass Tax Foundation. Tax Foundation. Tax yeah. Foundation. So, so it's a nonpartisan group that gives a, a read of the current budget and what's being proposed. And they kind of, they give us the down and dirty about, we ask them honest questions, they try to give us answers. Where do you expect things to go and that kind of stuff. Um, and they believe that this year is going to be a little bit different than past years and be prepared for the fact that the governor's budget may not be more conservative. Um, no, rather the House and Senate may actually be more conservative than the governor's budget because, you know, the, the, uh, the, fund, the, the, the amount of revenue that came, you know, yesterday, they announced the revenue was down again for four or fifth months straight. They are really looking at what the revenue numbers of April are going to be before they um, are going to make any decisions. You won't see the House or Senate lose anything prior to those getting the eyes on those numbers. So we may see a reduction from whether or not we will see the re what we'll see the reduction in is the, is is the, you know, right? that's the million dollar question right um, well, millions dollar question um, I'm not sure it'll affect SOA which is Student Opportunity Act but we don't get Student Opportunity Act so you know we are really worried about you know worried about transportation at, this is frontier we have from transportation frontier we're worried about rural aid because that is really what offsets um, that kind of thing and then a lot of these other smaller things that beat in and i'm sure the town's worried about other things about how they're funded and so that'll probably be you know be one of our conversations we have when we do meet with the town where their concerns about funding shortages and that kind of stuff um, but if they check chapter 90 our roads if they you know they do reduce all that then the town's going to have to adjust otherwise so we might be going into a fiscally um more depressed year so to speak um and so to, anyway and if our budget is tighter we got to be careful going into that because once we set our budget we don't have as much we don't have the funds sitting in, in to, to back us up out of school choice or those things those numbers have come way down and really have a can emergency so we run a tighter in budget and um you know, we do also have concerns that we may have an additional district placement, um, and that's something that's going to have an additional strain on the budget. So, how that all shifts in, you know, there's a lot of things that have to be played out, but it is, um, I think there's an opportunity to reduce your budget here, and that's why I'm kind of giving the speech here about why we think you should, you should be considering that. Um, the chances are that next year's budget will be level funded, will be even higher. So and that chances are it's going to be low well, even higher. So we have to, we're going to have to shift something at some point. So, so just to touch on that a little bit further, um, one, we're going into contract negotiations next year. So fiscal year 26, there'll be a new contract. So that COLA increase is unknown at this point, which always makes the budget process a little bit harder because hopefully we're settled by the time we're here, but you may not be. Um, the other thing is we've had multiple years of adjustments of school choice expenditures. School choice is still exceeding revenue based on the expenses are still exceeding revenue based on what we're spending this year. So we're talking about another budget adjustment next year to account for that. So um, we've been fortunate to help offset some of the rural, uh, not really the ESSER because we funded ESSER this year at 100,000. We have savings from retirements and we have rural aid to help supplement. So we're in a positive spot there, but as we continue to have to offload expenses from school choice, it's gonna make it even more challenging. So, you know, we're, I just want you to be aware of the thought that we're putting behind some of the recommendations and that it is um, enrollment driven. So can I, so enrollment driven school choice I, I see, you know, there's lots of room to add a few kids in every session. Uh, we have yeah, a sense. Yeah, jump up to yeah, the, yeah, I'm on this like, chair. Yeah, I'm on the perfect. next one. Sorry, so I jumped up a little bit. But, you know, is what I don't see here is sort of revenue discussion with school choice. I mean, is there any sense then that there are more people that might apply for school choice to return? I think this year would cap some of the ways. So as of today, we have 12 school choice applications, um, sorry, excuse me, 12 school choice applications in kindergarten. Okay. Six of those are siblings. We have another two school choice in first grade and a school choice in second grade. Of those 12 school choice kindergarten applications, 
we definitely know four siblings are coming. We're not sure about the other two. And then those other six, I mean, at this point are probably a no, just based on um, registrations, right? And so we wouldn't be accepting additional school choice students to create a second right. Right. Can't that. section, right. right? And so that's kind of like where, you know, for part of the reason, um, school choice has revenue has gone down a little bit because the, the class sizes have been really borderline and there's been a couple sections where we haven't been able to accept um applications because we don't want to push it to a second right but like the rising third grade so next year's third grade there's a place if we had more of those could take so it's a 10 and 11 right correct yeah. and you know at this time no 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 third grade applications and then another in place where can we advertise this i don't know i don't know but i mean i, I know we have a good program here you know i know we have students coming from a lot of the towns locally i don't know how the work could get out that you could show us in the sunday um i was at the collaborative last week and they had a whole big presentation it's their 50th anniversary that they're actually using as some pr uh, and they have people at the collaborative that will help schools, if you're a member school, help create a PR zone if you need it, help with graphic design. So I don't know if you're allowed to do that with school choice or not. So that's one question. The second question is, I mean, we're talking about to that before your next question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the nearby towns did actively campaign last okay, year yeah. for to get more school choices to them. And I found it very unneighborly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I also think that the school choice program in general is uh, very inequitable because only families who can manage their own transportation right. can access that. So it ends up leading to more segregated schools. So I, I would not be in favor of promoting school choice. Yeah, no, no. If we could get 12 kids, it would stop us from having to let someone go. You know. Can I make a comment about the number of kids? Just one more thing to keep in mind is that we always have outgoing sixth graders. Right. So the current sixth grade class has eight. So if Ben has 12 applications, you're really only making up four kids. Mm -hmm. So that's also another big part of the challenge, especially next year, we're gonna have another large sixth grade class of school choice of seven. So when then so seven go, you already have to backfill those spaces. So it's a challenge in a small school for sure, because you're not receiving applications like Ben just said for every grade level, it's primarily kindergarten and then you know, a couple others here and there. Um, part of the other reason our school choice has, our revenue has dropped is because um, the number of school choice kids with special education needs has reduced, which reduces the amount of revenue that you're bringing in. So I, the cherry sheet was a little bit higher than what I presented at the last meeting. I think at the last meeting I gave you um, projections of each of these revolving funds and I think I put 230,000 in for revenue and the cherry sheet came in at 250 or 260, but they're always a year behind in the numbers. And then when they adjust you October one, they make changes during the year. So I tend to go on the more conservative side, expecting that we may not fill every spot that's outgoing and we may not get the exact amount of revenue that's on the cherry sheet. It is pre-K, just gonna second go pre-K, is that maxed out 10 and 10? Is that is that income producing too, right? Yes. Um we are anticipating two full pre-K sections next year. Um there's a lot of interest. Right. And um you know, typically we can have up to 15 students in each class. Which any additional revenue in that fund primarily goes directly to support that fund. Um, expenses in early childhood are also exceeding revenue as they stand right now. So if we could get five more kids, it would just help build up our surplus because our surplus is dwindling. So these are all really great questions and they speak to why administratively we're making some recommendations to reduce our budget overall um enrollment i just gave you a snapshot of enrollment as well just so you could see what that looks like over the last several years uh resident enrollment is not really declining over the last couple but you can see i've accounted for some school choice decline there 
uh, we have overall shrunk slightly, but not significantly. Uh, but that's where Darius was referring to, we're in the whole harmless state, because unless your revenue or your enrollment is growing, you're only receiving the minimum for people on Chapter 70. Uh, so I've come to the end of what I had planned to present to you here. Uh, obviously, we can continue conversation. If you have more questions, let's talk about it. I wanted to remind you of the meeting schedule. A public hearing is on March 12th, and then the vote to adopt the budget on March 28th. And um, I know I would be grateful for guidance on how you want to proceed with the public hearing budget. <laughs> Yeah, you do need to vote about it. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's just we want guys to if you're required to give us a number to what we're sending to the public hearing. And just also know the public hearing, you can't raise, I know I've broken record on this, you can't raise your budget after the public hearing unless you have another public hearing. So you really have want another to come, what? unless you have another public hearing. Okay. So you can technically raise your budget after a public hearing, but you have to either repeat the public hearing to explain why you're raising your budget okay. prior to it going um, out to town. Um, but it's, I've never heard it actually done again. We always come in at a higher number and you can reduce afterwards without, no one argues when you reduce, they only argue when you, when you raise. <clears throat> so, so you can reduce. So if you look at the guidance right here, I mean, why don't we come in with a little bit higher without that reduction? Because we can reduce after. If needed. In, and what's the timing of letting, if you have to do someone, what is, when is it appropriate to let someone know that they're not going to be a position? So those decisions would be based on which um, grade level, right now, just looking at the whole thing, we'd be looking at a grade level re reduction of which grade level, and then it would get into um, the contract um, rules regarding reduction. So we'd be looking at uh, certifications and time of service and evaluation. So um, those are three points within the contract. And so you folks actually stay out of that. It, what happens is the reduction base and then the administration um, follows the rules of the contract, with, you know, communicates with the association what has to happen and um, kind of goes through. You also, you know, it, we don't know every staff member's plans. You know, right. it could be possible that someone was talking about leaving in any ways, and it could, it could take care of itself. But, you, you, but either not knowing that the process would be, we have to reduce by one FTE, and we go through that process of determining what that FTE, who that FTE would be. Well, and also the trend now, especially with educators, I don't know, some of specifically are front through, but the trend is people telling because they're leaving much later than they used to, waiting to June or right. July. And then you're, you've already budgeted and then you lost someone and you we, we might even let someone go. And then we have a space that opens up in July. Right. So I know it's very tricky in, the, in retention and in employment of educators. Right now, so. and we also are part of a other network of other, uh, we are still part of, an, I would say part of a larger district, but we're really not, but we are connected with other districts and there may be openings in other buildings. So, you know, that kind of stuff where someone could decide to um, stay in the union, but teach in a different building. So I, I don't know about those, but I haven't gotten that part down the road, but I just want to know it's, it, it is the teacher's market right now. Let's just put it that way. Uh, there's a lot of positions open. So. <clears throat> Peter. Yeah, hi. Um, my suggestion would be that for the time being, there's no decision really needed, for example, this evening, as to uh, specifically, you know, proceed on any, uh, either the current budget number that's presented or some lower budget number, uh, because there's just a whole lot of unknowns. I mean, we're very early in the budget process and there's uh, there's no sense that yet at, at what the town's position is. Um, there's uh, the things you're, you're there, there are considerations in terms of staffing uh, that, you know, may seem difficult to the moment. And in a month or two, they may suddenly have a solution that, that you know, 
treats the staff all the way we hope that the traffic staff will be treated and yet still manages to you know be able to adjust things in a way that helps our budget don't know but we don't have to decide anything tonight um i think that uh, you know so that from my own point of view the, the the guidance i would give would be uh proceed with your uh internal discussions within the administration and 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 with the you know your staff and so on about what the possibilities are you know searching for a way to uh be able to uh grab savings if they are needed in a way that still respects uh the you know hope of this of, of all of us uh certainly the school committee to to treat our uh, teaching staff you know in the best possible way because they're what makes this school work um so you know and then as you mentioned just in passing that you know that there may be uh out of district issues for you know that will come up that will change our expenses and that also is something that you know certainly in a month or month and a half we will know more about than what we know now uh so that you know i would even be happy to go to public hearing with the same number you've got right here um knowing that uh i you know i have a hard time imagining that we would end up wanting a higher number but you know there are you know i mean i can imagine a case where if you had a significant uh uh out of district placement that materialized late in the fiscal year uh that you could even go back to town in the fall for like you know emergency additional funding um that's happened in the past and uh um you know, we're not, uh, no one's got 2020 foresight um, on all this. So, but I don't see a need for for us. I don't see how us making a, a decision on, you know, reducing by some specific amount uh, this evening is, is needed. But a general guidance that says, yeah, you need to keep working on this because this is a problem that is probably not gonna go away. Yeah, there's another question because I, I know some teachers in their elder years, um, 55 to 65, I'm in there, but um, do we start talking about buyouts and things like that? I know, you know, in the in this sector, if you've been in for a certain period of time, your, your time is not increasing that much from 56 to 66. And so if you take, if you, if you leave early, you know, I've got people who've done this, do we, do we have a conversation about with senior teachers if we need to that, That's not a public school practice because we've yeah. got their contract to, we can't offer a buyout and they need to get to usually 30 years to get their right. maximum retirement. Right. So yeah, we never like, incentivize a retirement. I've never well, I've, that. I've public school friends who did that. I mean, they're 55, they've been in 30 years and they they actually, he's the head of the unit. Like he knew all his right age and, and so he took the early out. Um, but he has 30, it is rare to have someone 55 that has 30 years. That's starting to get out of school. But we, I don't know if we have anyone with 30 years or 30 plus years that might not understand their they have, You know, they could leave really still make just as much money in retirement. You know, the, the, the amount you get is what the last year they're going to add into your 401k, not that big, you know. So, if you, does that help at all? I don't know. I'm just, I don't know if it helps. Yeah. You know, one, um, in, in my you're taking some of our best teachers and telling them to leave early. Well, no, 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 I, I know. <laughs> I know. Right, I know. That's my first fear. Yeah, um, no, well, my understanding with the retirement chart is that the biggest jumps in percentage do happen in the last few yeah. years. Yeah. Right. So, like, even someone who's been, you know, has reached halfway to retirement, right. they're, they were to retire, they're not getting 50% of their final pay. Right, they're even well below that. It's even not if, yeah, even if you get thirty plus years. Yeah. And, well, yeah. thirty plus years, you're 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 closer to exactly. your yeah. possible eighty percent. But really, you're you're jumping a lot in yeah. those last few years. Absolutely. Yeah. The the percentage you, much, you, yeah. you percentage you get is a combination of your years of service and your age when you start collecting that retirement. Right. So. Age plus service equals ninety. Yeah. Is it gets you eighty percent? 
Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Sixty. Yeah, he was ninety. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. yeah, so sure I got, I got the I saying right. Yeah, you do. The main yeah. teacher has it. Was listening. Thinks I got it wrong. Please jump. Yell out. <laughs> I think it's age plus service. Sure, we'll recognize you. Yeah. <laughs> right. No. Mine will be ninety-two. I'm not going to make it ninety. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, so, um, but that is usually that's that was the the ringing formula. Um, and there's, you can do buybacks and there are, I mean, I imagine some contracts have done some sort of uh, incentives, that kind of stuff. We are prepared to have that kind of conversation. That'd take a lot of analytics to go that deep to see if it'd be worthless. Right, right. And then right now with the, I hate to, you know, as I said earlier, that you we lose so many teachers go begging for them to stay home. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to incentivize. Them. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear the, the, the example is I have very big districts, very large employment pools. And mm -hmm. It was easier mathematically for them to do that. Right. Not for, not with small school. It makes more sense. So. Um, I said my thinking is very very similar to Peter's, but I'm reluctant to go down a position before we absolutely have to. The select board has asked us for a level services budget. Um, and you did slip it in there that we've got this question mark that we might have another out of district placement. Do you have an idea of when you would know about that? Yeah. It, the process is not, um, okay. is not, on, well, it's on, it's on some sort of timeline, but the timeline can be every, every week we'll have a stronger, or we'll have a stronger, yeah. So okay. going to what Peter said in, Six weeks will be in a much stronger place in knowledge about where we are in the in the RNA. What happens with out of district placements that happen after the budget finalized? You find the money to take care of it. Still got to do it, right? Yeah, okay. there is such thing as a emergency relief depending on what type of out of you know what the total cost is. Because you have a very if there's, there's a large range. You have programs in 38 that a student could be involved with. You have programs outside of 38 which includes greater transportations. And then, you know, um, I'm just saying all programs aren't referring to any kind of things. And if you had a residential, it could be even way higher, like, you know, hundreds of thousands. And, and that kind of thing, the state does have emergency relief that you go after in the middle of the year and it pays. Again, it doesn't take for everything, but it takes a good chunk out of the, the pain off the district. So, um, and, and so something again, I learned at the, and I know the numbers wrong, but I learned at the conference. Um, and I know this is for special ed support. The town is, and I don't know if this applies to out of, out of district placement. The town is responsible for up to 75,000 and then the state takes over a certain percentage up until 150, is that ring the bell to anyone? So circuit breaker yeah. is, so circuit breaker covers, I believe it's 48, after 48,500. We kind of round it up when, we do, right. when we're doing the math, it's supposed to be around 50, but, um, they then will pay 70, it depends on the year, but the average is they'll pay about 70% of any monies after that 48,500. So if you have a $90,000 placement, you're gonna be, I should get an easier number, and let's say it's 50,000, yeah, yeah. you know, you're gonna be, you know, they're gonna pay 70, you're gonna be on the hook for 30% of, the of, of, that, of the difference after the 48,000. And does it go up to, and I thought there, there's a cap to it, like at 150 or something? That's that probably where you can get relief. Everything, yeah. yeah. that's where you can get uh, relief. And you can also get relief within the first year, where they'll even help you out more if you get a move in and it's not a shared. So if someone moves in the middle of the year, you have to do a shared cost with the center district because you can't just, um, one district can't just absorb it that quickly, so you do a shared cost. But if you can't do it that way, there's other ways. This gets in a little bit, I know that Karen Perrin you know, would be here to kind of talk about the different ins and outs, but, um, there are different reliefs, but still, there's a financial cost to that district. And that applies, does apply, similar for it that out of the district placement, right? The yeah. district especially. Needs. And so the issue is with smaller districts and like, you know, I would say other school committees are talking about it. Well, Western Mass, we're all very similar, but larger districts, it's, it's a line item. It's in the millions for, you know, that kind of stuff. And it fluctuates up and down depending on enrollment and that kind of stuff. It's just very hard in a district like ours that you may not have one for several years. Or if you have one and yet you're getting circuit breaker, it gives you a false sense of money because you're getting some money back. And then all of a sudden you lose that and the circuit breaker. And then you go two years without it. And then you got to get back onto that 
it, so it's a uh, it's far more difficult budgeting in your folks seats because it's it can, it's almost anything can happen every time and if it does happen it's those are the needs of the kids and so then we got to service those kids yes. as best we can so um it's the reality of it thank you yep I'm inclined to agree with Jess and Peter that I'd like to hold off until we know it's necessary. So I would recommend that someone moves a motion to vote the number beginning of the slide show to, and then do vote that, and that, that's basically what everybody had. Let's hear decide. from Peter, but thank you. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I was going to say, it seems like it's the sense of where we should go, so I'll make a motion that uh, uh, we uh move forward to the public hearing with the number that was four point shall we fill in the four point one nine percent four point one nine percent um and that's good enough right there i think yeah. yep i second the motion discussion Let's say, Shelly, you are doing your job. <laughs> Both of you are articulating really well why we should consider that. And thank you for understanding us and wanting to go through the entire process. And we know you're looking further down the line than we are in this second. And thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, the 4.19 is not awful is lower than I thought it would be because of inflation, but I hear what you're saying. It's not about just this 25, it's about 26 and 27 and how that all comes together. So I, I definitely respect to hear what you said. Um, that's my comment. All right, sounds like we're ready to vote. Uh, we have a motion to move forward with the figure 4.19 percent. Right. To to the public hearing, which will be, I think, on March twelfth. Right. All in favor? Four in person. And Peter's frozen. Peter, can you verbally tell us? Oh, uh, I I'm, I vote yes. Thank you. Five zero. Yeah, not my agenda. Anybody else know what's next? Recess. New business. Oh, okay. So this is me. All right. So I'm serving on the legislative committee of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Uh, got involved with them because of our interest, our interest and my interest in the rural schools bill. Um, so part of my participation in this legislative committee, we now have at, within MASC. Oh, let me back up. So each year at the conference, there is a delegate assembly. Every school committee gets to appoint one delegate I've done it the last three years, I guess. Um, and most of the activity that happens at that delegate assembly is voting on resolutions um, of things that we want to pressure the legislature or DESE or whoever, or you know, each other, you know, we, we resolve that, you know, school committees and superintendents should try to, you know, advance their diversity, equity, inclusion efforts or whatever. Um, we now have a policy within MISC that after three years, uh, if something has not been resolved, like we've passed a resolution that calls for some sort of action and that action hasn't happened, after three years, it's going to sunset, basically going to expire. However, they're asking for committees to sort of bump them back up, like renew them by just passing, passing an old resolution again. So I am bringing forth this resolution on recess. We would like all schools, Sunderland already has this, to have at least 20 minutes of recess per day for their students. It passed overwhelmingly at the delegate assembly three years ago. Um, having us pass this, this would not actually impact our own practices, but this is part of being, uh, you know, good colleagues within MISC. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve the recess resolution. I'll second. So motion from Jessica, second from Amanda. Any discussion? It's crazy that schools don't have appointments of recess. Right? Yeah. I figured this was an easy one. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All in favor? Four zero in person plus Peter is five zero. Moving on, we've got first reading of some policies. <laughs> nice way of putting it. So, yes, your policy subcommittee has been hard at work. Um, and if it 
it pleases the committee, I can just run through what these are. Okay. I'll just spend a little more time this time and it's easier to vote them next time. Um, so in summary, and then again, you can ask questions either now or you can save them and ask them in between or so on and so forth. Um, PCD is public gifts to the school. It's updated language around fiscal review by the school committee. KHA is public solicitation in schools. It's cleaner language in our district did not update it from the last time NASC updated it. So the changes were even more drastic um, from the last time NASC updated this policy. We missed it. So now we didn't do it. LBC, relation with non-public schools. There's new language around there. Um, it doesn't pertain much to Sunderland Elementary because there's no private schools in town, but it does very much pertain to, you know, certainly Deerfield and then at the secondary where we have to support the private schools in our town. And there's certain level reporting and such back and forth there. It's within that language. Um, EHAA is district security related to technology. This is a new policy that provides a foundation for administrative procedures and practice to ensure information which is stored and accessed in the district technology is appropriately protected. We do have those procedures in place. We have a, um, we also have a uh, um, acceptable use policy and that kind of thing. But this is what they're recommending that you guys have in place to ensure that your tongue goes below you know, the, my the administration to make sure that we have these things in place. GB, GBEE is personal use of technology. Again, a new, is another new policy. This new policy outlines the responsibilities of district personnel and their use of technology. It is expected that this will provide a foundation for future um, further administrative procedure. So, you know, stuff that we find in our faculty handbooks and so on and so forth around technology. JCJ is student use of technology. Um, this is uh, another new policy, the division of responsibility of student use of technology was expected um, and so forth. Again, stuff that we would find in the student handbook that they would come down from this policy. Uh, KCD, community use of digital resources, another new policy recognizing that digital resources, notably public Wi-Fi, <clears throat> are now a common public resource of school, outlining appropriate considerations within those. KDCV is district-wide website and social media. Another new policy, yes, and this one will recognize that districts and schools commonly will have websites and social media pages and to outline best practices around those. Um, and then EF, EFC is universal uh, free school meals. This is updated to the new language of the um, all students receiving um, free lunch. Remember, we kind of put that on hold, I think it was about a year ago. Um, that there was a new policy coming out. We said freeze, don't even bother addressing it because they're about to make universal free lunch. And that's what they did. And this is the updated language around there. And then EFD, um, school nutrition program um, charge policy. And so again, that fits in with the new um, free and reduced lunch, um, free lunch for all uh, legislation. So those are the uh, new policies. And then the removal, let me just go ahead and do the removal one. Yes. I have to go look that up so I didn't get my notes and I didn't update it. That is um, case, uh, KCB, which is community involvement and decision making. Um, NASC is, re is recommending that um, that be removed, that there are other there are areas for public input within decision making um, of the school community and other areas throughout other policies. You don't need a separate one for that. Thank you. Yep. Any questions or discussion? No. All right. Thank you. Moving along. Uh, next one, COVID communication policies. Um, this was requested by Joe. Um, Joe and I both have kids in a class who received COVID cluster notifications last week. Um, so we asked for an update. Sure. So right now our call procedure around um, COVID or any other illnesses is that if there's groupings, if there's three or more within a grouping, a classroom or another identified group that we can say that there's possibly greater spread. So um, from COVID, if it was strep, um, stomach virus, you know, that kind of thing where um, there is a cluster within a single classroom. And so that at that point, nurses would send a letter home. Um, and we can make sure, and then we did have last, um, 
last week we did have a COVID cluster in a classroom and we had several teachers who were also out with COVID. And it is a, was a big blip in um, the COVID numbers. Our numbers since, um, we still do report numbers of COVID, even though we're not, um, I'd say actively collecting them because we're not doing any kind of screening or that kind of thing. But when the nurses um, are aware of it, they're collecting that information and we are reporting it um, to the group of Deerfield, Sunderland, Greenfield, and uh, good morning, or morning we are part of that that coalition of that. Um, our numbers that we've reported from Sunderland since returning from vacation um, was two in the first week, zero. Two, so they go to Thursday. So the second through the tenth, two. The eleventh through the seventeenth, zero. The eighteenth to the twenty-fourth, zero. And the twenty-fifth to the thirty-first, ten. Um, and I don't have the numbers for this week. That, that's students or students and staff combined? Yeah, students and staff. Um, any that they, they, they get. Now, again, those numbers is as good as the report, or good as the testing, that kind of thing. So um, could those numbers, those weeks of zeros where there are no COVID in this building? I'm going to guess that's not true. Um, and I don't know, could that 10 number be higher? It could be. Um, because we don't know who's testing and who's reporting on their testing um, and how that often works out. So you mentioned, so the COVID I understand, um, and it's based on a number, not a percentage. So right. three in a class of 20 or three in a class of 10, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, the other said strep. So with HIPAA, you might not know, is it three kids being sick or three or four that have sick of the same the same it's not just three sick kids it'd be the same. the same yeah so we have to have that community we have to hope that we've got that communication in this right. case we did correct four kids out and they don't say you're not changing you're not if families aren't sharing their you know for the most part there's a lot of sharing on that kind of sharing. thing um yeah. i think there's some, a lot of sharing <laughs> of the actual um, yeah. other stuff too um but you're right if someone kept home sick you know and didn't report we didn't go to the doctor, so they never got a diagnosis of one of those things. Um, but now, in yeah. terms of the staff, though, so is that a percentage? Or is that so? So this was I, I, I heard big number. So I, Ben, you can correct me or tell me if you can or not. But I I'm doing the math. You said ten. I know four students from the class of so draft. I get six staff. Maybe I heard seven. So whatever. So if you have six staff out of 20 is that draw any attention or, or, or 10 out of 20 is there any case where you're going to be concerned with the staff percentage of people? do we have any policy on that is that making sense no about we don't we don't because the, the groupings are you know um you could, I guess you could have a staff meeting where you had a, a major outbreak and a supremacy staff meeting. Right. Or if, you know, um, you know, that kind of thing, staff members are friends outside of school and they go out and, you know, um, do something together or that kind of thing. You could have that kind of thing happen as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we do not. The concern would be if we didn't have enough staffing to adequately supervise the building. You know, again, this is, like I say, a new, new frontier of in the age of this kind of thing, you know, where and I imagine they had stomach bugs years ago that went through staffs and that kind of thing. Um, and this one was very coincidental because we had international night on Thursday, staff meeting on Friday, right? And then the people were sick over the weekend. Was that accurate, Kenna? Um, this is 20, 26. I'm not sure we had a staff meeting on Friday. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's what you don't have to look at. Don't say publicly yeah. if you had a party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, we didn't have a staff. Yeah. It was more of the deal. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. It's helpful. Um, be sure. And I just note so one of those cases was from my family, and I reported it to the school, and we never got any follow up about what uh, protocols were for my family member to return to school. Mm -hmm. And when I went and looked it up, that these recommendations have changed since the last time I was aware or the last time it was sent out to families. Okay. Which is that now you only need one negative test before you can unmask at school before 10 days. 
that has never been shared that I could find. Still five days out though, right? Is that still five days at home? But five, day five day. days, the day that you test positive is day zero. Yeah. You're supposed to stay home through day five. And then it's you can return day. with a mask until now it's one negative test. It used to be two negative tests 48 hours apart. That's no longer Jesse's recommendation. Thank you for the update and discussion. Any other comments or questions? All right, moving on to reports. Um, the Capital S subcommittee of five chairs had our first meeting on Monday, um, planning for the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, it's going to be very similar to in the past, we'll do it online, but now Darius does not have to administer it himself. We're gonna do it for him. Um, and we are trying to get it done, um, what did we say, March 14th. We're gonna try to send, basically we're gonna send it out on a Monday and a week plus five days to a Friday is going to be the due date, um, which brings us to mid-March. Is it Friday the 14th? Fourth, fourth the 15th. The 4th to the 15th, um, uh, then we are going to write up an actual report um, and have it ready for the joint meeting in April for presentation and approval by all. So this is uh, moving up the timeline. In the past, sometimes um, brand newly elected school committee members have been asked to evaluate a superintendent they've barely met right after their election. Um, so we're, we're doing this in a way that people who have actually gotten to work with the superintendent are completing the evaluation. Um, Interesting anything? that public hearing for the budget is right in the middle of that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of that survey, yeah. Um, uh, let's see, I also wanted to report, uh, we, should, we should know by the end of this week if the rural schools bill is moving forward or if it's been killed for this session. Mm -hmm. I, I just checked online when we arrived. They have not done it as of today. We should know by Friday. Um, oh, and then school council was the other thing I wanted to talk about. School council is doing something that I think is actually really cool. So we read um, a book called Street Data, uh, which is about um, how, how we gather information from a community for the sake of equity, making sure that everybody is included and really represented. Um, and it is in the school improvement plan, which was created by the school council, that there's going to be some sort of feedback gathering from families. Instead of doing an online survey, which is the most common thing, we're going to be following the model in the street data book and actually doing a series of listening sessions. Um, we're going to do them in person and online, uh, different times of the day, morning, daytime, and evening. We're gonna have an evening one with childcare and pizza. Um, I think we're going to try to do one with just the LPAC families, the English language learner families, um, and, and families who don't want to participate in those can um, ask for a one-on-one -on -one listening session, or they can um, yeah. respond to the questions in writing if they would like, and they can do that anonymously or you know, by email if they would like. So lots of options for people to be heard. Um, we're really trying to make sure that we get to hear stories and not just you know, checking a box on, on a survey. Um, to try to Or I, I mean, 
Yeah, you know, I, I think just to feedback on what Jessica there. was saying, we are just, you know what, the last 30 seconds, my computer shut off, and so I just plugged it back on, so it's so, I, I mean, yeah, I assume it's back, but so just, if someone could just summarize really quickly what you said, just said in the last 30 seconds. Joe is asking if we're going to go out um, to try to recruit individual families to participate, basically, to make sure that they're represented, and he's saying that there are sometimes barriers and, um, not, not barriers, but, uh, Social reasons that they don't necessarily participate. Social work, you know, obligation. Yeah. 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 I don't think we we talk about that specifically at our school council meeting. One of the reasons we are having different meeting times and different ways that um, our community can provide feedback is to try to reach as many people as as possible. So again, um, in person in the morning, in person in the evening, and later morning virtual midday during the lunch hour, opportunity to request a one-on-one -on -one listening to session with someone from the council, um, uh, sending an email, filling out the survey anonymously. So we are trying to um, get as many people as possible. And, you know, who knows by the end of March, look, by the end of March, we'll have a much better sense as to how, how many folks we were actually able to reach. And that in itself will be a, a data point. Will you, will you be tracking demographics then in the so, so that you know if you have a diverse um, pool? Because again, one thing that I'm very familiar with because of my family environment and just connecting and being overseas culturally, this is more of an American thing is to fill out surveys and give out feedback. Many other cultures, especially Eastern cultures, that's not their place. Mm -hmm. Education is way up here and they trust and have faith and just they know that's they, they don't critique that so that's right yeah and then yeah, I mean, that's a really really good point and but just yeah i think um from my own seat here and with the staff as a whole like the the foundation is built on partnering with with families and built on relationships and we really hope families feel that um, and that they feel welcome. Um, and so throughout this process, and you know, as we always do, we are really going to be trying to connect to as many people, um, demographics and culturally as possible. And I mean, I know Matt Howell has very good connections with yeah. yes. families too, but he's not a school council, so asking him to help sure and i we're on it we're on it yeah but I, I met with him last week and right. i'm going to the meeting next week yeah but i'll be there as well so okay. okay thank you it's just it's a not a peeve it's just a piece of my yeah. focus that it's, i was it's a good um uh, for sure. i'm sure and if you would like to personally help us by speaking to families that you're connected with i was waiting for you to offer I yes will. yes <laughs> yeah. that was yeah. great <laughs> Half a dozen on the basketball team. So yeah. Very good. Great. Um, any other committee updates? I'm going to hold off the collaborative. We just had a meeting on um, last Wednesday, virtual. One of the big things is the, the chair, Todd Gaza, is Gaza, is um, he's up for his annual biannual review. So we're just starting that. I just got the document today to fill out. He sent a summary of the last meeting, but it, it just came out yesterday. So I, I wanted to share it with everyone before I talk. But one thing that I am pursuing, and I'll be talking to you and I'll be talking to you, um, is I just want to hear what we're what we are taking advantage of from the collaborative, you know, in our program. So that you know, I'm new, I don't know. I wanted to hear what we take advantage of, what we could, what we would like to have more of. Uh, and then so I, I'd like to, you know, reach out to Garrett at some point and talk to you guys and just I don't know. I asked Carrie. Carrie uh, who represents the Deerfield group. She's going to reach out to um, Deerfield Elementary School, see what they, are, you know, what their data points are. Just, just see what's out there and what we're, you know, what, what do we need? What are we, you know, have we used in the last five to ten years? So, just let me come. Sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Peter, anything about capital? um we have a meeting tomorrow evening um just continuing through the process of evaluating requests from the different departments um you know i'll keep you posted and Thanks. at some point uh 
you know, we may want Darius to come pay a visit to the committee and uh, coordinate that with him. And uh, I, I will just say that uh, in listening to the discussion on the oil tank, um, while there is, I'm sure, some frustration about, well, we could have done stuff better, um, I take a whole lot of positive stuff away from that, uh, that experience uh, along the lines of, number one, uh, we don't have any contamination on the site and we got the oil tank out. Okay, and that's huge. Number two, I think it is, I'm, I'm just delighted at how uh, much coordination there is between uh, the school administration and town hall and the various town departments in doing this sort of stuff because, I mean, that's the way you, you, you make the best out of whatever the situation is by getting everybody thinking about how they can pitch in and help rather than you know, why aren't you doing something different? Um, and so um, I just, again, my compliments to Shelley and Darius for um, how they've uh, worked through this whole process. And there are always going to be a couple of things we could have done differently, but I'm, I'm overall, I'm delighted with, with what's been accomplished here. Thanks. I think rounds to the superintendent's before it. Budget, budget, budget. Budget and projects, and uh, we are the window project for Sunderland Elementary. Um, we're finally up the paperwork, um, hopefully this week, and we put out the fur cog to be out the bid by the end of the month. So it's that time. So next big project is in the works. Thanks. We have no executive session tonight. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make motion. Megan made a motion. I'll second. Amanda seconded. All in favor, four zero in person, five with Peter online. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.